This is the day that the Lord has made. We are rejoicing and we are glad in this day. Amen. And I believe the Lord has a word for us on this Christmas Eve. God has a Christmas word from heaven. And that word is fear not. Don't be afraid. There is a Christmas word from heaven. Fear not. Fear not. Can you say that with me? Fear not. Say that to yourself. Fear not. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be found acceptable in thy sight. God, you are our strength and you are our redeemer. In Christ's name, amen. Sisters and brothers, as we think about the immense joy and the unmatched blessing that came to our world and to our homes because of that first Christmas, sometimes it is important to weigh the greatness of the blessing, the immensity of the blessing that has come to us, the joyful blessing that the angel talked about with the shepherds and that the host of angels sang about in our text and see it and value that blessing against the awful backdrop of the human condition that existed at the time of that first Christmas and that exists in a variety of shapes and forms and places and locations today. Because Calvary and Calvary's guests, Christmas always comes as the luminous foreground reality for the faithful. It comes as light and life for the faithful. But as it comes, it comes against a background or backdrop of a shadowy, suffering, anxiety-filled world that's often oppressed. Christmas comes and has always come. Even the first time it came, it comes as joy to the world, but it shows up in a world that is often a mess and a mishmash of spiritual darkness, a world marked by sin and death and decadence and wars and rumors of wars and conflicts and political machinations and schemes and fear and, and fear and fear. Fear often lies at the center of our spiritual conflicts. In its most serious manifestations, it is an emotion and it is a spiritual experience that none of us enjoys. You don't like to be afraid. I don't like to be afraid. Fear doesn't fear, feel good and it seeks to take us over when the devil gets in the details of it fear. But fear and anxiety are baked into the world and this world system and into our existence as we understand existence and discern it. Fear just comes with the territory when we have come into life. Fear more than anything is that intensified anxiety that we feel punching in our hearts and in our minds and in the solar plexus of our souls at a gut level, which says to us, this thing that you're facing, this person, this being, this situation, this disease, this debt, this governmental system, this depression that stands in front of you is bigger than you. It is more powerful than you. It is gigantic and you are small and perhaps insignificant and you're weak. It is always Goliath and we are always David without our slingshots when it comes to fear. Fear made Adam and Eve run away from the very presence of God mistakenly. Fear caused Abraham to lie about his wife and claimed that she was only his sister, putting her life in jeopardy. 
Fear is what motivated Egypt's Pharaoh and the Roman Empire's de facto Jewish leader named King Herod to kill all the young Hebrew males two years old and under. It was fear. It was fear of losing power that motivated them because of the advent of some greater power, they thought. Some greater people, they thought. E Pharaoh said, these Hebrew slaves are multiplying and they're becoming more numerous than us. Fear. Fear leads to genocidal plans. Fear says to us, fear says to us, because of the presence of the unavoidable force in front of you, you're going to have to run. And you're going to have to run fast or you're going to have to fight possibly all the way to the death. You're going to be destroyed or you're going to have to destroy. That, that's the voice of fear. Fear is one of the reasons why support for Donald Trump is so strong because Trump speaks to white fears and he addresses a culture of white grievance. As Professor Eddie Glaude out of Princeton so eloquently and passionately declared during a recent MSNBC interview, he said it's white grievance that is empowering Trump's base. And they continue to support him because they are scared of what is to come. Franklin Roosevelt said, he really said about fear, fear is not an actual thing that one can touch. It is something that settles in the mind and poisons the will. Therefore, there is nothing to fear but fear itself. Kendrick Lamar said, the hardest thing for anybody to do is to look themselves in the mirror and acknowledge their own flaws and their own fears. Jay-Z said that the burden of being impoverished isn't just that folk don't always have enough things that they feel that they need, that that's part of it, but it's really the feeling of embarrassment rooted in a kind of fear of others' opinions. That's what the poor will always feel, and they'll do anything to relieve themselves of that anxiety, fear. Someone else said, don't do anything for fear because fear will never do anything for you. Fear won't ever do anything for you. In, in, in his book, in his book, The Courage to Be, a book that Dr. King used to carry around in his briefcase and read late into the midnight hour, he carried around this book, The Courage to Be, until it fell apart. And he read this book, he kept up with it to manage his own fears. In the best parts of the courage to be, the German philosophical theologian Paul Tillich said that anxiety, a cousin to fear, is something that just comes with existence in this fallen state. It just comes. It's just here. Anxiety, which is a cousin to fear. And we have at the root of all of our anxieties a fear of non-being, Tillich said. That's the fear of no longer existing at some point. We are aware that the music will stop in Motown and in every town eventually, and that we live lives threatened by death. And that is the root fear, which spawns three main anxieties, Tillich said. Number one, the first main anxiety that we all face that's connected with fear is the anxiety of fate the anxiety of fate. Number two, the anxiety of nihilism or meaninglessness. The anxiety that my life really doesn't make a difference. Thirdly, the anxiety that guilt and condemnation will eat me up and eat me alive eventually. Those are the three main anxieties that every human being, it doesn't matter your religion, we deal with these three main anxieties. And at the bottom of all of it is the fear of death. He said that all of us come here having to deal with anxieties related to fear, that fear that forces us over and over again to be scared of life. So anxiety, it just comes with the territory of being alive. 
and at the root of all of it is fear. Tillich would probably say that when Jesus was born, he was born into a world wherein every individual had to deal with these three main anxieties and underneath them all at the very bottom lied the fear that at some point they would have to leave this mortal frame. We will have to take off our mortality and put on eternity and perhaps immortality in one form or another. Sisters and brothers, sisters and brothers, brothers and sisters, not only do we experience fear and anxieties as individuals, but we experience them together. We experience them in mass as cultures and as societies and as nations. Just as Joseph and Mary and Jesus were subject to forces which seem larger than them as individuals. And our fears can become exacerbated as we face large, powerful systems of oppression and control which seem not to care for the fates of our lives, which do not seem to care about the purpose of our lives. That's nihilism. That do not seem to care uh, whether or not we have any meaning in our lives that do not seem to care about whether we are guilty or innocent in life. Often powerful systems and empires hoist guilt upon its subjects as a mean of control. Calvary, this broader sense of fear and anxiety attached to the works of evil governments and empires should surprise no one. There is now and has always been different periods of time in history different points during the long story of humanity when it seems as if the world was on extremely high alert because during such periods in human history, as is the case today, there was a palpable sense of danger in the air among the citizens of various empires and nations with no justice and peace to be found nearby. Often such feelings among the populace were directly related to the widespread brutality and violence and greed of evil men. Very rarely women were in charge, but men who had ascended to power, and with that power they had demonically decided to subjugate other human beings in efforts to attain more power. So they burned and they looted in these societies and, and countries and nations. They burned and looted. They slaughtered and raped and pillaged. They enslaved and dehumanized others. They took property and burned down the property that they didn't want. They took people made in God's image and God's likeness and turned them into cogs in the machinery of whatever they were trying to build up. And during such periods, most of the then known world's people were overwhelmed by gnawing uncertainties, uncertainties, anxieties, and fears made worse by the encroachment of such terrible rulers and oppressive empires. According to Genesis 5 through 9, read that when you get a chance, which includes the antediluvian period the era right before the flood waters hit the world. You all remember Noah's flood. This comes to mind because both powerful men and also some women and even your average Joe on the streets and grassy lands, everyone was only committed to doing and thinking evil. The whole culture and society, they were engaging in violence and criminality among their neighbors and the worst among the lot ruled over others. So much so that Yahweh decided there's too much fear. There's too much anxiety going on. I'm going to send and cleanse the earth with flood waters and start over again. And then this time of great fear and anxiety among the peoples and empires showed up as the rise of civilizations in Sumer in Mesopotamia. It was true during the rise of Babylonian and Assyrian empires. This widespread perpetuation of fear and anxiety was true during the period when Egypt ruled the world in all of its pharaonic glory and African beauty. Yes, Egypt, African Egypt 
impress the world with its black African genius and wisdom and, and its idolatry. But the Egyptians also put fear into the then known world and intimidated the then known world because of its wealth, its religious superstitions, its cruelty, and its slavery. The whole book of, a portion of the book of Exodus is about Egyptian created slavery. Even as the Egyptians themselves tried to manage their own fears by creating an entire religious mythology around tombs. That's what the pyramids are, tombs, pyramids, and the afterlife. They were trying to deal with their fears, even as they caused fear. And elsewhere, the Shang and Yin and other dynasties of China were no joke either in their imperial efforts to rule over and control people's lives. Anxiety and fear were in the air. We're going somewhere, stay with me. Anxiety and fear were in the air from then to the times of Alexander the Great and the rise of Hellenistic hegemony. That's when the Greeks took over everything. To the time when Rome, oh, here we are now. We're making our way to the text. To the time when Rome ascended to power and then became the most potent military and political force in that part of the world. In fact, sisters and brothers, this Roman power is featured in our text in Luke chapter 2. During that first Christmas, oh, you might have missed it. When Greco-Rome ascended to its heights, the world had seen nothing like it, with the possible exception of what was witnessed in North Africa, in Kemet, in Egypt in the past. But Rome took complete control and took things to another level, and they ruled with skill and efficiency and terror at new depths of depravity and idolatry, Rome. And in this time, a time of great intimidation and fear and anxiety that comes into view in this morning's Christmas story, God is going to turn the old order of Rome, he's going to invert it and usher in a new kingdom, a new reign, a new rule. You see, as we think about the kind of world that Mary and Joseph were born into, along with their firstborn son, Jesus, whom the angel, under the instruction of God, said to name Jesus, which means Yahweh salvation, we must keep in mind that their world was not one that could be peacefully and easily fitted into the cover artwork of a Christmas card. It could not easily be superimposed using the gifts of well-meaning artists who portray serene Christmas scenes of Mary and Joseph riding on their beasts of burden, silhouetted, y'all have seen the cars, against a beautiful moonlit sky. Or as the artists depict a nice, genteel, peaceful looking scene of nice, clean hay. Clean hay and nicely adorned Mary and Joseph and handsome animals looking intently toward the manger, which is a feeding trough. No, we must consider the real picture, the real story minus the mythology with its smells and dirtiness and birth juices flowing and fear in the air so that we can relate to the main message of this morning's text. Because in fact, the world that Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus inhabited was a time and place when the Roman Empire and civilization with all of its advancements and potential was also known to brutally suppress and control people's lives as the citizens had to worship the emperor in the next 50, 60 years after the life of Jesus there would be out in the open emperor worship where the emperor had temples and sanctuaries built to him. And if you were a Roman citizen, you better find yourself in the church of the Roman emperor. This was a wild civilization with all of its advancements. And they believed in the mythology of Roman and white superiority. It was this very prideful and corrupted Rome that was looking over Mary and Joseph's and Jesus' shoulders in Bethlehem. And many of the Jews, like this young couple, they simply were relegated and classified by their culture as those who didn't really matter. They were Jews. 
they believed in this strange God named Yahweh. They worshiped on the Sabbath in these temples and they were led by the Sadducees and Pharisees. They just are superstitious. They don't really matter. They are second class citizens at best. I, I mean, think about how Mary and Joseph must have felt when that sudden decree, the decree that's mentioned in verses one and two of our text, went out. They had to gather up suddenly all of their belongings so that they could quickly go back to Joseph's place of ancestral origin so they could be registered in Bethlehem in order to pay those high taxes. They didn't want to go on this trip. Mary was nine months pregnant. Likewise, sisters and brothers, imagine the high bills that some of us are going to have to pay back. As you think about Mary and Joseph and their concerns about taxation, think about some of the high bills that we're going to have to pay back when the credit process kicks in to repay the cost of all of the gifts and presents we have bought in order to not just bless loved ones, but sometimes in order to impress folks who will never be impressed by us. I'm not trying to pile on your mind with more anxieties, but what are your motives? What were your motives for purchasing all that you purchased this year? And what did many of it have to, any of it have to do with this blessing that the angels are singing about in Luke chapter two? For, for reasons beyond their control, even with God, in their lives and guiding their lives, Mary and Joseph, who lived in Nazareth, are inconveniently rushing off to a different city, Bethlehem, because Joseph hails from the lineage of David. And as they pulled themselves and their belongings together with a nine-month pregnant Mary getting up on her beast of burden, can you imagine, sisters? I can't imagine it being nine months pregnant, and you're riding miles, I believe 60, don't quote me on that, I forgot the exact number, but it was a substantive amount of miles, you're riding on a beast of burden, you're nine months pregnant. They probably thought, oh God, what will become of us? What will be our fate? Do our lives really have any meaning to others and to you? And will we be condemned if we do not come up with the money once we find out how much we owe to pay Rome what Rome now says we owe Rome? And sisters and brothers, as we think about this contextual history of that first Christmas and consider what is happening in other places today in our world from Gaza, close to where Bethlehem is today, to the Sudan in the Darfur region, to Ukraine, to the streets of Chicago and Memphis and New Orleans and even a few hot spots here in Detroit. Think about how people are afraid. Think about how people are displaced and placed in harm's way. And as we think about the internal battles and warrings that are even happening in our church bodies, like the United Methodist Church, that is anything but united today as nearly 8,000 congregations in the last four years have left and joined with the African Methodists across the waters. I'm not talking about the AME church, but there's an African, a growing African representation of Methodism over in Africa. And you got congregations here, some white, some black, whole lot of them white, who said we're leaving the United Methodist Church over the issue of appropriate sexuality or sinful sexuality in the life of the church as a doctrinal issue. And as we deal with what might be raging in our own hearts and minds as Christians, as we contend with various personal fears and depression, the question comes, what is so good about Christmas this year? Particularly with all of its fear and anxiety. And what's so good about it any other year? How can the glory of Christmas shine, even though it sometimes seems almost swallowed up by our midnight anxieties, failures, and fears? Hey, you're not even concerned about any of these broader macro threats represented in national and trans international conflicts and societal problems, but on a very micro level, personal level, you are threatened by your own anxious emotions that you can't fully control. As you deal with aging, 
health challenges or an ongoing fight with a child or a sibling or a parent or you are overwhelmed by great and weighty nostalgic thoughts that leave you feeling depressed because of the fading joys of Christmases which will never be again. Places you were, the person you were, filled with scenes of the people you miss who sat around the table uh, perhaps 10 years ago or even last year, but who are now absent this year because they either don't want to be there because there's a rift or because they cannot be present. And as the years pass, you feel a growing anxiety and fear crowding out your Christmas joy. Well, I've stopped by to repeat what the angel said, fear not, there is good news that can break through the dark clouds and night skies, not only in our text, but in our experience as Christians. In the text, even though Rome was seemingly in control, even though Rome seemed to have the upper hand over everyone, and even though Mary and Joseph, who were physically exhausted and taxed, no doubt, by their journey, and psychologically vulnerable because some folk were gossiping and had been gossiping for the last nine months. Can you, can you really understand or do you understand the kind of psychological assault that Mary and Joseph had to go through for nine months? Some were whispering that Mary had been creeping with someone other than Joseph. That's how she came up pregnant. I know she said an angel stopped by, but we know an angel didn't stop by like that. It, it was the blacksmith down the street who stopped by. or that they were both lying. And Joseph had jumped the broom too quickly because of his sexual lust and passions. And they had fornicated together, which, which was prohibited, uh, prohibited in that culture and societies. And so rumors, rumors were starting to fly everywhere. And at the same time, after a long journey, apparently they did not have enough money to bribe someone to put them up in better living conditions as Mary was about ready to deliver because you know the text says there was no room for them in the end. But while all these negatives are occurring, there is a, the revelation coming of a powerful and personal presence greater than Egypt, greater than China, greater than Russia, greater than Rome and greater than Mary and Joseph's personal anxieties and fears. This blessed personal power is a power and personal presence greater, far greater than our own sources of anxiety and fear. Jesus is greater than any fear you've got to face. And, and strangely, at first, this revelation takes place beyond where Mary and Joseph are located. Get this, the revelation takes place somewhere other than where Mary and Joseph are located in that extended house barn that was kind of situated, some archaeologists say, like an adjoining garage to someone's house today. The revelation, the message of this special light that's coming into the world, this luminous power, doesn't happen directly around the manger. But it shows up not far, but far enough away in a dark field where shepherds are watching over a flock of sheep. And though this might not sound like it at first, but this is good news for us. Because the fact that God was at work on Mary and Joseph's situation, concocting and uh, uh, unfolding God's plan beyond the barn. They were not completely aware of what was happening over in the field beyond their immediate location and pressures and fears. L lets us know, this whole thing lets us know that beyond what we can see, beyond the argument, beyond the doctor's report, beyond what's going on in your household and in your heart, perhaps just around the way, God is doing something on your behalf regarding your temporary situation something that others are becoming aware of, something that others see unfolding that we're not yet privy to ourselves. 
Hey, 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 there is something very comforting and exciting about knowing that for God's people, God is putting some things together out of what appears to be broken pieces and bad options. That which should evoke fear and disappointment and that just beyond your sight line and my sight line, God is already working behind the scenes on that which you didn't know about or on that which you had forgotten about, and that with that God has told some other folk beyond your circle to get ready to bless this individual who's coming your way because I've got my hands on their life. Even before you show up in their lives, God is doing the preparatory work. He's working on someone else around the corner, out in the field, as you're dealing with your barn situation so that God, once he reveals his power to them and what he's doing in your life, it'll all come together when you have an encounter with them. While Mary and Joseph are in the barn, God is not only doing a work in the barn, but God is doing a connecting work out in the field with the shepherds at the midnight hour. And it's going to bless the good that is already taking place in the barn. There was already good happening in the barn. I mean, she was delivering that baby. She delivered the baby whole. She was healthy, and they're cuddling little Jesus. There's good happening in the barn, but there's some good happening in the field. Oh, and this just is coming to me right now. It, it doesn't matter your geographical location or place in life. God has a blessing with your name on it that he can get to you. God knows your address, whether you're in the barn or out in the field. The shepherds are out there minding their own business. Tending the sheep. Shepherds were considered one of the lowest professions anyone could be involved in. It didn't pay great. Shepherding didn't pay great. It was an exhausting, isolating, sometimes dangerous job because there were wolves, there were lions, tigers, and bears. Shepherds were often somewhat unkempt and dirty and smelly, living from living with their livestock so closely. And yet God decides to show up among the least and the lowly, and the lowly with a message that the most powerful in Rome would not hear until much later. Verse nine, and we're almost done, verse nine, the angel suddenly appears, and the angel is shining out. The angel's glowing in the open night. The glory of the presence of God has been transferred to the angel's presence because the angel had been in the presence of God the angel is still reflecting some of God's glory because no being, no entity can remain in the presence of the Lord and not be changed by the Lord's presence. This is why it is to our advantage that we spend regular time in the Lord's presence today and during the week. Why not begin your Christmas morning tomorrow before you unwrap your presents and check on the food? Why not spend a half an hour? In the presence of God, worshiping God, praising God, meditating on these first Christmas narratives before God as you worship the Lord in spirit and truth with a psalm on your heart or a song in your heart. And the rest of your day, God will work out to your advantage. The angel of the Lord appears with the glory of God shining through him, shows up in the shepherds. They're scared. They're terrified. The Greek word is translated terrified in the NRSV version of this text. They're, they're terrified. And so knowing their fears, the angel speaks as they are shocked and cowering in that field. Don't be afraid. In Swahili, the angel says, don't be hopeful. That's the Swahili word for scared. Don't be hopeful. Don't be panicked. Don't be scared. Shepherds foresee. Now, now y'all got to give me just a little time, about a minute, to deal with what the angel says here, because it was working with me this morning before I left my place. The angel says, don't be scared, foresee perceive, 
Look, sometimes in order to help us deal with our fears and anxiety, we have to look at what God wants us to look at. We can't look at everything in our lives and be totally free from fear and anxiety. We have to look at the goodness of God. We've got to look at the scriptures. We've got to keep our minds centered on good things. Our perceptual framework will affect our emotional condition. Oh, I just said something right there that I should back up and repeat, but I don't really know what I just said, so I can't back up and repeat it. <laughs> the angel says, see, don't be scared. I'm bringing good news of great joy, good news of great joy, which should elicit, which should elicit not just a little joy, not just a little something, something kind of joy. But I'm coming to tell you good news, shouting news of immense joy, of overflowing joy, shout worthy, sing worthy, news of great joy, joy beyond measure. And it's not just for you shepherds. It's not just for the lowly. It's not just for the young righteous couple in the barn around the corner who have been ridiculed and questioned and looked at skeptically and cynically as second class citizens. It is for them too. But God wants them to know and you to know that God is bringing good news for all people. Okay, you lost your place to shout right there. <laughs> This news is going to effectuate everybody's life, not just yours, not just people living during this period in history, not just folk who are living around that area, which is now kind of like the Gaza Strip. No, down throughout history, all people will be blessed by this good news. It's good news. It's great news because of its reach. It, encomp it encompasses more than you. It encompasses more than them. The news transcends just this one moment in history. In fact, it addresses the deepest concerns and fears of all. More than just the, the Jews, more than Gentiles, more than black folks, more than white folks, more than the Romans. The good news, this great news, addresses all people at the core, at the seat of who they are. Because for all people, finally and decisively, in the city of David, a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord, has been born. He is here, amen. He is here for everyone willing to come to him in faith. And this message is universal and it extends beyond religious boundaries. For all who will accept it, Jesus has come as the revelation of the invisible God. Because one has come to take on and forgive all of our sins. So no human being would need to be terrorized by the fear and anxiety around their guilt and combination, condemnation. The angel says, in essence, one was born today who has the voice and the power and spirit to give purpose to every person who lives, rich or poor, royalty or peasant, African, European, Asian, Indonesian, Spanish, Arab, those with disabilities, those with perfect health, those with high esteem and those of the lowest esteem. And the Lord has come to give meaning to life for all, to all creation. Today in the city of David, Christ has come, so fear not. Don't be hopeful. Don't be scared. Though we might be discouraged sometimes, don't be scared. Fear not. There are still oppressive principalities and powers with which we must contend and crowd against. But fear not, for Christ goes with us. And Christ has come to show us that forever is a living reality. And that eternal life is more than a fantasy, but it is an ontological spiritual reality. That's a big way of saying it's a reality that's a part and going to be a part of our very being. Eternal life is within you right now if you receive Jesus Christ as Lord. So now we can trust by faith that we will no longer have to fear death because God has come down 40 and two generations to keep God's word. The virgin has conceived, divinity in flesh appearing, and to our hearts he is endearing. As I really take my seat now, Yes, Luke begins our text with a listing of the large and in charge, Caesar, 
Quirinius, key leaders who are part of the Roman machinery. But the good news for all of us is that because of the birth of Jesus, all of us can now prepare to be saved. Oh, can't you hear the voice of the angelic choir again and again? The Christmas word from heaven, fear not, why not? Because glory to God in the highest, peace on earth toward women and men of goodwill. Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth toward women and men of goodwill. Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth and goodwill toward women and men. As we stand to our feet, Hear the message from heaven. Don't live your life in a box of fear. God wants you to be free and liberated from all your fears. Maybe there's one here today you want to be saved. You want to be delivered. Jesus has come for you. He has lived and died for you, and then he has risen for you. Mary's little baby, the lamb slain before the foundations of the world. Is there one? There's nothing better. To my right, you want to be saved. Maybe you want to join our congregation. We invite you to come forward. Calvary is a wonderful place to work out your soul salvation. Maybe you want to recommit your life because you know you have not been walking with the Lord. We invite you to come.